Hello and welcome to today's um, session about risk analysis for building automation system. We want to have a look at yeah, building automation systems as in the last talks. Um, I think you already have a quite detailed view about building automation systems, field bus systems, and um, yeah, what the key facts are. And today we want to focus on the risk analysis part. So what is a risk and what one has to do if you want to perform a risk analysis. First of all, we want to have a look at risk in general. So what is risk? Um, if you want to define it, we can say the risk is defined as the combination of the probability of an occurring event and the extent of the damage caused by this event. The risk can have a positive or negative impact. In contrast to endangerment, the risk has already an evaluation of the relevance for an event included. So we now know the risk is a combination um, consisting of the probability of an event and the damage which is caused by the event. Um, yeah, you just multiply both values, but in before you need these values and we want to have a look in this talk how to get these values um, and what you need to consider. So risk analysis, is it like the same thing as risk in general? The risk analysis can be defined as, or can be understood as the complete process for determining and treating risks, or just one single step in this process. Here in the talk, um, as well as in the source uh, linked here, uh, we want to have a look at the complete process of identifying risks, analyzing them, and also evaluating them. So we want to have a look at the whole process. How can we identify risks? How can we determine how bad or how good they are? And how we have to treat them? How do you perform a risk analysis in general? So I had a look in the lecture, in the literature, and um, yeah, I will show you my sources later on. Basically, I'm, I had a look at the uh, BSI 200 standard. Um, this is a standard from the German Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik. So this is a German organization which is responsible for security and information technology. And they are handing out standards. They are available in German and in English. So don't worry if you find the source linked in German. You will find as well on the website of the BSI an English version if you want to have a further look inside. But let us come back to performing the risk analysis. Um, we first need to do some preparational steps. So we need to introduce a systematic information security process. Um, this is a very huge step, but it has to be performed in, for example, companies. We need to define a scope and get the most information about it. We need to define protection needs. So what do we need to protect? Do we need to protect confidentiality, integrity, or is availability the most important thing? Um, we have to define that. We have to check if some measurements are already implemented. So for example, for integrity checks, um, if we have some hash uh, values which are already calculated um, to check if the data is still um, in good integrity. We need to define when a risk analysis has to be performed, how, and when it has to be checked. So a risk analysis is a thing that you perform once, um, and then yeah, processes change, um, there's new developments in the company, and so you need to redo this step or this risk analysis again and again. So it's a continuous process of single steps, and you need to know when do I have to redo a risk analysis? Um, all this needs to be defined for the company uh, so that one is sure that one has a process and that it is not forgotten by someone who is maybe no more in the company and who was responsible for that. Um, so this is important. And we also have to define how we react to risks. There are different strategies how you can treat risks. Um, we'll come to that later on. First of all, we want to get a threat overview. So we want to have an overview um, about threats. We want to determine elementary and additional threats. 
Um, we want to note the impact of elementary threats to different objects of interest. So a company has different objects of interest, for example, the building, um, but this can be as well servers or infrastructure or some devices, whatever. And there are elementary threats like fire or um, floodings or things like that, earthquakes. And we want to note the impact of these elementary threats to our objects of interest. We want to note threats to our target objects and we also have to look for additional threats. So in the BSI standard, there are already some yeah, basic threats um, which are out there defined and we have to look if they apply to our objects of interest. Um, then if they apply to, we have to look how the risk is for this um, object and this threat. But after we have checked the, I think there are 47 basic uh, threats. Um, after we've checked these, we have to look if there are maybe some additional ones which only apply to our objects because they are kind of special, whatever. Um, yeah. For the impact of elementary threats to different objects of interest, um, um, it might be useful to add that we have to look, for example, if we have the object of interest, an operating system, uh, the yeah, elementary threat of fire might have a different risk to the operating system than a malfunction somewhere in the code or something like that. So there we can imagine a lot of things and all these kind of categories are very huge and it is important to have a like, yeah, prepared step-by-step -step book which you have to work with if you do that the first time. Um, we also have to classify risks. So we need to determine the extent of the damage caused by these risks. Um, this is very individual, so you have normally direct costs. Um, then there is a non-financial damage. Uh, this might be some reputational damage, for example. Um, you have some consequential damage. If something fails, then maybe something other fails and this causes a lot more um, yeah, damage to your company. Um, you need also to consider the effort uh, to repair the damage. So maybe the damage itself is not really bad, but it takes a lot of effort to repair it and so it is quite costly. And you also need to consider the frequency of occurrence. So if something occurs quite frequently um, and the risk is very low, but even if it's uh, not that much costly to repair it or to fix it, if it appears uh, quite frequently, um, you might want to change it. Um, yeah. And for this step, it is useful to use some qualitative uh, categorize. Normally there are a maximum of five um, which are recommended or the recommended number is maximum of five and uh, this can be very dynamic and is also very individual. Normally you define something like uh, very few, few, normal, high or very high or some categories like that and you define what is the category itself in more detail. And yeah, after you have defined the damage and the frequency of occurrence. Then you can design a risk matrix, which you can see here at the slide. So this is an example risk uh, matrix. And this can be also individual for each company. So you have to define yourself which potential damage with which frequency results in which risk. For example, here we can easily see that a rarely occurring event, which, is, which has the damage um, of life-threatening, has only a medium risk. This is very rarely occurring. Um, but even if it is life-threatening, the risk is only set to medium. On the other hand, if we have an event which occurs very, very often, um, but has only a limited uh, damage, then the risk is set to high, so the risk is higher as the possibility for the occurrence of such an event is a lot more, um, yeah. Um, other things to say. Frequency and potential damage can be adopted in this matrix. Um, so for example, for 
yeah, categories with low risk. Um, it is a quite widespread strategy to accept the risk and to just monitor the threat so that you know if something appears, if such a risk um, is coming to your company and then you act accordingly. For medium risk, it is recommended to implement some safeguards, um, but they might not be sufficient. So there might be um, safeguards to just decrease the risk to get it down to low or something like that. Um, for high risks, normally you have implemented and planned safeguards, which are not sufficient and you should act more to get them to a lower risk. Uh, for very high, um, you have no adequate protection actually, and very high risks are also very rarely accepted. So for even for high uh, risks, it might be an option to accept this risk. Um, we'll come later on to the strategies how you can treat risks. Um, but very high risks are very rarely accepted. So the risk treatment, as I said, you can do different things with the risks. The normal intuitive option would be to counteract the risk, so to implement some new safeguards, but this might not be your best choice. Um, risks can be avoided. This would uh, mean you exclude the cause of the risk, so you do something against the risk. It can be reduced, and for that you have to modify some conditions um, which are necessary to get this risk uh, appearing. And if you modify the condition, you can get the frequency of the risk to a lower value. Risks can also be transferred. You transfer a risk, for example, if you sign an insurance. So an insurance is nothing else that another company is taking the risk for you and you pay the company for that. So you share the risk with others. And you can also accept the risk. Um, we have seen that in before. So if you have a very rarely occurring event, or risk, you can just accept it and say, okay, I know about these risks, but they are so fewly uh, occurring, so I just accept them. If they occur, that is, yeah, let's say just bad luck, um, but then we have to handle it. We won't take any effort in before to decrease this risk uh, to a lower uh, value of the risk. So, Let's just have a more detailed look in the different strategies. Um, risk avoidance would normally mean restructuring business processes. Um, countermeasures are normally associated with higher efforts or costs and the remaining threat cannot be accepted. So this is a basic situation. And then you should think of restructuring um, maybe this might be appropriate for other reasons as well. So if you have a business process and inside this business process you have a quite high risk and you want to do something against it and the safeguards, the additional safeguards that you can just implement or throw on the problem to decrease the risk uh, might mean that you have to pay a lot more. So it would be a good idea to just consider of restructuring the whole process so not only looking at the risk and how you can decrease it, um, but to have a look at the process at all and how you can restructure the process to decrease the risk while restructuring the process and gaining some money in not paying that much because maybe the process is getting more simple. So sometimes the change of an existing process is easier and more elegant than just putting more additional steps on it to decrease the risk. And all countermeasures are normally accompanied by substantial restrictions to the function and the comfort. So if you put additional countermeasures on um, yeah, business processes, normally they are getting more complicated because you have to pay attention to more steps, you have to perform more steps, and so the whole thing is getting more complicated. And this is why it could be a good idea to just rethink the process to get it in a more simple way done. Risk reduction. Um, to reduce the risk is always a good idea, um, as you can imagine. Um, the thing is about setting up additional security safeguards. So a 
Additional security safeguards normally decrease the risk if you choose the right ones. And the documentation is important, so you have always to document it um, if the object of interest is an item. And there are normally standards and best practices where you can find um, yeah, additional security safeguards which you can implement to decrease your risk. And they are normally yeah, handed out by information security committees. Um, for example, as well, um, the BSI is giving such information. But you can also find additional security safeguards by professionals um, who have already gained some experience in their work life and who know how to act to special risks and how to decrease them or which countermeasures are the right ones to choose. The risk transfer is just meaning that you transfer the risk to someone else and the other party which you involve now is just taking the risk for you. This is normally done um, for purely financial damage as it is hard to perform something else or to transfer something else, but it might be worth to think about shifting the risk to someone else. So sometimes that is the cheaper option than implementing maybe some additional security safeguards. Um, uh, outsourcing is an option for that. So if you have a process which has a high risk, you might think about outsourcing this process to another company. So the other company is doing the process and you do not have to care about the risk of the process itself for yourself. Um, there are normally commercial or technical reasons and the contractual partner is maybe just better placed to handle the risk. Maybe um, there is a very special process which you have to perform um, maybe every, every month in your company and uh, it is very difficult to perform the right steps in the right time. Um, if you do not perform it according to the process, you have a very high risk. So it might be a good idea to find someone out there who is doing this process, maybe also for other companies, who have a lot of experience in performing this process because he's doing that all day long and not only once in a month. And so it might be a good idea and the cheaper option to just uh, say, okay, you do this process for me, so I'm paying you money for that, but I do not have to consider the risks in this process anymore for my company as someone else is doing it for me. The risk acceptance, um, yeah, it's a good question when it's fine to accept risks. Normally, uh, there are different categories of people. Some are accepting risks more likely than others. And the best case is if you accept only risks with the low level. So only risks with the level or label low are accepted in your company, that would be fine. Then everything would be green after your risk analysis. If you have identified some risks and if you have labeled them all with um, yeah, the risk level low, then you have quite good chance to not run into trouble but as some events are only occurring very, very rarely, but the countermeasures to get them to the risk level low um, are so costly that it is not an option to consider. So sometimes you just have to accept them. Uh, respective threats only result in damage in special circumstances. This might be um, an effect of some yeah, risks that you have identified, only if some special circumstances come together, then the risk results in some damage. And as this makes the event maybe the occurring frequency very, very rarely, uh, then it might be also an option to just accept it. Yeah, sometimes the risk is very difficult to avoid, so it's hard to do something against the risks, because if you have some risks identified and if they are kind of new, um, there might be no safeguard uh, measurements that you can take against and this is a difficult situation and then you just have to accept the risks because maybe you have a very new process, you have something uh, kind of newly developed and there are no countermeasures that you know right now um, which you could implement and so you just have to accept the risk. Um, on the other hand, you also have to consider the effort 
and the costs of the countermeasures. So you always have to look at the costs. If you implement some countermeasures, which bring the um, yeah, risk level from very high to low, this is a very good option. You should consider it, but you should, on the other hand, have a look at the costs. If the countermeasures are more costly than the value of the object itself, then it might be a bad idea to choose um, this countermeasure um, as it is not worth it. So the object of interest which you are looking at is just not that much worth than the countermeasure and so it's not an option to uh, consider that. Um, if you want to have a look at the risk estimation regarding K and X, again a slide that you have seen already um, with some detailed information about the KNX protocol. So which fields we have in a telegram which is flowing through the KNX network. And um, this is interesting because here we can see which information we have available in the telegrams which are in the network. Um, for KNX we have no encrypted traffic on the wire if we do not use KNX Secure, which is kind of new and only working um, with KNX Secure devices. So normally in existing um, installation especially, we only have yeah, kind of old KNX devices and they are just talking normal KNX, not KNX Secure. And so we can listen to the traffic in plain text. This means we have all these information down here or on the slide. Um, available for performing some analysis, for looking at these information if everything is kind of normal in our network or if there is an anomaly or something that should not be there. So we'll now have a look um, at some possibilities how to decrease the risks um, in KNX networks. Um, but before we look at how to decrease the risk, we have to know how to identify a risk in a KNX network and we have, to, yeah, we have to compare risks in our network. So if we have a network, let's say of 1000 KNX devices um, in a building, we have to determine which is the spot with the highest risks. Um, so where is the most problematic spot in our network, um, which devices of all these 1000 KNX devices have to be protected the most and there are differences and so first of all we have to develop a value, a numeric value for example um, that we can work with for identifying the risk. And for that we can use some static and some dynamic data. Um, for the static data we can use this data yeah, this is normally static for an installation. So meaning if the installation is already installed, if it is working um, and if everything is switched off, we can use, we can still get or gather these uh, static data to get a risk overview about our system. So the static data is giving us a normal overview while dynamic data um, is used while packets are um, transmitting the or transmitted in the network and so we, we can enrich the static value by a dynamic value. The data used for static data um, is the network documentation, a building plan is very useful as well as the ETS project file. So you know the ETS software is used to program KNX devices and so if we have the KNX or the ETS project file we know which devices are installed where they are installed, how they are connected to each other, on which segment of the network they are installed, and all these information are very important for our risk analysis. We also need to look at the affiliated devices. Um, we need to consider the physical accessibility of attached devices, the physical accessibility of the wires where the devices are attached to, and also the reachability of other clients. We'll come to that a bit more detailed in a second. First, we just have a look or an overlook at the dynamic data. So this is um, yeah, kind of analyzing the live situation in a network. Here we are analyzing the traffic on the bus. Um, there are different approaches possible. So you can do a flow analysis. 
Um, there you look only at statistical values, who is talking to whom, um, how much data they are transmitting. So this is kind of condensed data. You can use the packet inspection, maybe you know this as well. And there you look really at the payload of the telegrams or the data which is transmitted through the network. And you can also do some physical layer monitoring where you really look if there were maybe some new devices attached to the wire, um, but who were not talking KNX. So you look even under the KNX protocol at the physical level. For our dynamic data, we just want to look at the type of telegrams which is occurring and the number of telegrams which is occurring in a segment of the network. So I talked about classifying the risk level of a device. Um, here's a suggestion of uh, four different classes. So if you look at one device, you can say it's a class zero device according to its risk level or class one, two, three device. For a class zero device, normally you say the device itself cannot communicate via the KNX protocol. So we say it's an unproblematic device. There's no risk out of it. If you have, for example, a power supply, so it is not talking in KNX and so an attacker would not be able to do something via the KNX protocol to modify this device as it has no physical address and so the risk we can say is unproblematic. On the other hand, if we have a device of class level three, it has a high threat. This means these are devices which are very rarely installed. So you normally have only one device of this category per building, for example, a heating system. Normally there's only one heating system per building. If this device fails, it affects the whole building. So all people who are working or who are in the building are affected by the failure of this device. And the error is causing kind of high financial costs. So for example, if the heating system fails during winter, um, your whole building is rendered useless as your employees might not work anymore in the building because it's just too cold. And this is causing a high financial cost. For the access level, this is a thing you have to consider and it might not come at first in your mind. So you have different access levels in your building. You have some restricted areas, you have some devices who are, which are a bit difficult to access and you have easily accessible devices. Restricted areas are very good. Um, these are areas where only few people can go to or where um, you have an access control system which is logging very well. And so you can easily see who went there, when did he go there, and maybe also what did he do there. Maybe you have video surveillance or something like that. Devices which are difficult to access are normally motion detection sensors. They're a good example. They are mounted at the ceiling. And so for a normal public visitor, it's very hard to get access to this device as he needs uh, something to step on and others will see if he is working at the device. Easily accessible devices are light switches, for example. They have a nice height um, when they are mounted at the wall. So you can just pull them off the wall and you see normally the KNX cable in behind. So the access is very easy to perform and quite fast. You do not have to do a lot. What you have to consider as well is the access level of the wire itself. So as we know already, we have a field bus system. So the traffic which is flowing on one network segment is transparent on the whole segment. A device which is attached physically to this segment may listen to all the traffic of the other devices. And we know as well, the traffic is not encrypted. So who, as soon as you are connected to this part of the network, you can listen to the whole traffic, you can see the data which is transmitted, you know everything. And so it is an, it is an important point to consider um, how the access level of the wires is, because if you have easy access to the wire, you can easily look at the whole traffic which is flowing there. And there again, we have class zero to three, so class zero would be protected wires. They are especially protected um, or only installed in access controlled areas. On the other hand, class three would be public 
access accessible wires. Um, they are installed on the outside of the building. They are not shielded. Um, if you have, for example, a bell at the door or something like that, there might be a wire which is transmitting KNX traffic and it might be accessible from the outside. You do not even have to enter the building and so it's easily accessible for everyone. The reachability of other clients is interesting as well. So here we do not mean how many clients are in the part of the network we, were look, we are looking on, but we are meaning how many other devices can I reach from this point of the network. Can I reach all the other devices which are in my network or can I only look at the devices which are in my network segment or maybe at some others? Um, we have to consider that as well. Um, to the dynamic data, so this is some yeah, enrichment data. Before we had some static data, we can use the static data already if the object is not installed. So if we plan to install a KNX system to a building, which is um, yeah, right now built, so there are no devices inside yet, um, we are planning everything in our ETS software and we already know the static risk for the whole thing we are planning. So we could use this already at the planning phase to decrease risks here. The dynamic data can be used to see um, yeah, for example, how many telegrams are in a network segment. The more telegrams that are in a network segment, the more interesting the network segment is normally getting for an attacker as he can see more data and this is always helpful for an attacker as he knows more afterwards, normally. Um, we also need to look at the type of telegrams. So normally we have only telegrams addressed to group addresses because we know the normal operational mode in KNX works via group addresses. A device is communicating some data to a group address and some other devices are listening to that data. But we also have one-to-one -one communication. So um, these are, for example, configuration telegrams. If we program a device with the ETS software, for example, we are transmitting um, telegrams especially to only one device, so to a physical address. And this is normally very rarely occurring, not during normal operation. And so as soon as we have configuration telegrams in our network and we do not know about that, we should get an eye on it. So this is um, yeah, something that is normally should not be occurring. So there should be something wrong and we should have a look. Um, after we considered all these classes, we can yeah, calculate a risk for every network segment. And for example, if you have devices of class 1, 2 and 3 in a network segment, we have to consider um, yeah, the uh, risk level 3 for this whole segment as one segment is always a transparent um, yeah, part of the network. And so we see here um, we can normalize this to a numeric value and then afterwards we can compare the values of the different parts of the network and can find out in that way which is the most endangered part of our network or where we maybe should implement some additional countermeasures to decrease the risk. So as I already said, decreasing the risk, we have different possibilities. For example, the packet inspection and there we look at the payload of the telegrams itself. We can have a very detailed analysis about that. Um, we could extract a rule set out of ETS so we know who is talking to whom and what data are they transmitting, what should be a normal range. For example, if you have an office building like here and there's a temperature sensor which is talking to the heating system, it should normally transmit values between let's say 10 to 30 degrees Celsius, maybe 40. But if we have a value of minus 100, this is something that might not be there. As normally here in North Germany, we do not have temperatures like minus 100 degrees Celsius. So this would be something which is wrong and where we also, again, have to have a look at. Um, for the ETS, we can imagine the software 
And in the background, we have a database. So it's a Microsoft SQL database. And we could extract the rules from this database in a kind of automated way, get a whitelist filter set so that we know at the different network segments um, when data trans is transmitted from one segment to the other, we have a look at it. Is it fine according to our rules? If yes, we transmit it. If not, we just drop it. So it's kind of a firewall working in a deep packet inspection way. We could also have a look at the network zoning. So as said, um, the KNX network is always coming in a tree-shaped structure. So we have different parts. And normally devices are grouped together as the wire is, um, yeah, the amount of wire is decreased or is minimized in a planning phase. So is it if a device is situated very closely to a wire, it's attached, it's attached to that wire. And we can use this to decrease the risk in a way that we say um, we group devices together which have the same risk level and so we now know how we have to protect this wire. If it is yeah, a very important wire because there are devices attached to it which have a very high risk and so we need to protect it especially. Um, yeah, we have the amount and the type of packets as a dynamic value already set and um, we could give already support at the planning phase. I also said that um, during the planning in the ETS software, we could already use the static values of the risk to decrease the risk in the network and to say, you should not um, attach this device to that part of the network um, because it has a very higher risk than the devices which are already in that part. We could also use intrusion detection systems with some net flows. So net flows might not be only used in IP world. You can also transfer the thing to um, the field bus systems. Um, it was done in a yeah, student's work. Uh, so we have the data flowing in the network condensed to net flows. We transmit these net flows in band um, with an integrity check and so you could evaluate the results at the central collector with some machine learning approaches to detect if there are attacks or not. Um, I have linked uh, the students work here where you can have a detailed or a more detailed look at. Um, then we have the physical layer security. Um, monitoring the physical layer is a very interesting thing. You could detect changes in a network layout if a device is attached, maybe newly attached, but not talking, then you would not be able to detect that in a pure KNX or upper protocols. You can only detect it on lower levels like the physical layer. And um, you might be able to detect possible manipulations, but Andreas can talk you or can give you a lot more insights about that. So as an outlook, what is interesting um, for decreasing the risks or for talking about the risks in KNX networks or field buses in general, um, we have these uh, coupler units. I talked to you already. Couplers are um, occurring as line or area couplers. They are the same device and they normally have a filter capacity. So meaning they work like a very tiny firewall um, saying, okay, this telegram needs to be transferred to the other part of the network or not. If not, it's just dropping it. And um, this filter capacity can be deactivated by just a single telegram sent to the coupler unit. So this is kind of a bad situation because if an attacker is there and if he knows about it, he can just deactivate the filtering and we will have the data. Um, normally the filters are not used in a firewall um, yeah, with the firewall concept in mind. Um, they are more used in an operational way, meaning you decrease the traffic on higher segments of the network as it would be just too much um, to be handled by the small data rate which we have in KNX, which is only 9.6 kilobits per second. Um, yeah, an automated extraction of rules from the ETS database would be another thing which could be implemented in the future and which would be helpful. And also to design a language 
for these rules, which could be um, yeah, extracted from the database, some simple rules for the filtering, some listening tasks. So we could also think about logging for a given time window and that we transmit this data to maybe some special agents which are out in the field. And the statistical data could also be kept on the agents in each network segment and we just say we want to have this statistical data from this time window so that not the whole traffic in the network is um, yeah, too much and getting too much. Um, so if you have an intrusion detection system, as I said, there was the approach to do that with NetFlow data. But actually, we have already few data in the header fields of the um, KNX telegrams. And um, so it is very hard if we condense this data again, um, it is very hard to see if there are attacks or not. So it would be an idea to have some smarter agents out in the field that, getting, that are getting listening tasks from a central collector so that we can have detailed looks at special parts of the network to a given time frame. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, be prepared. We will discuss them right now. Um, but first, let me thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions later on, you can just contact me um, about my contact details, which you can see on the slide. And here are my references. So to get in the discussion, if you do not have any questions yet, I have some prepared. Um, yeah, I'll just read them out. Um, where is the highest risk in KNX or building automation systems in general? Should the using of building automation systems be forbidden? As we've seen, we have risks there. So is this maybe such a bad thing that we should forbid it? Um, what has to be considered when planning a building automation system according to the risk? Um, you could imagine an attacker. Is it worth attacking such a building automation system? Which information could you gain and what would be interesting to you? Um, and again, last question, what is the best strategy to find risks? So what is the best way, in your opinion, to find risks in your network or in your automation system or whatever? Um, so I'm happy to discuss some of these questions and also curious for your questions, um, which came up during the talk, um, to answer and to discuss them with you. Thank you.